Hi, Ralph and Lonnie Diamici back again for Planetary Calendars, and we're here with the October 2017 forecast. This time, I get to read Ralph's wonderful words directly from the calendar. This is a great month to get significant things done. No planets change direction, aka change their minds. All the planets are moving direct, except Uranus and Neptune, and they like being retrograde anyway. The Sun conjuncts Jupiter, a lucky transit, as the King visits the Prince's country estate. The lovely Vesta is conjunct the Sun during both lunations. Like the Vestal Virgin sitting beside the King and Queen, whispering both about virtue and higher purpose. Use this time wisely. On the 5th, the full moon finds Mars conjunct Venus, so do something fun with co-workers and privately plan a candlelit dinner with someone who matters. On the 9th, the sun trine moon denotes the best time to bring projects to fruition. On the 10th, Jupiter, aka the big guy, moves into Scorpio, shifting us from negotiation to determination and possibly ruthless action. How intensely Jupiter plays this year depends on the changing position of Mars to whom he must defer. He doesn't defer to too many, but. On the 14th, the warrior princess Venus enters Libra, taking a dominant place on this chessboard. When women speak, listen. Mercury joins Jupiter and Scorpio on the 16th, so projects crystallize even quicker. By the new moon on the 19th, a new paradigm for cooperative, determined, efficient action is in place. Try to keep up. <laughs> On the 22nd, as the sun enters Scorpio, Mars chases Venus into Libra. Good for socializing, not so much for work. On the 26th, the sun conjuncts Jupiter, so take a day just to feel good. There you go. And that's October. It's going to be a very interesting month. It's kind of a nice break after... Uh, the eclipse in August and everyone recovering pretty much during September, which is what you had to do in September after the, the, the eclipse that cut right across America. We're all still reeling a little bit from uh, August and September. It was, uh, you know, it was the Chinese curse. They right. live in interesting times. I mean, the eclipse cuts right across America, and within the next 30 days, we have two of the biggest storms ever to hit the United States, Harvey and Irma. And we hope this finds people recovering, although we know the recovery is going to be long and slow. Very, very slow. And this is a powerful, powerful influence. This is why historically astrologers always warned people about, about uh, eclipses. In fact, when you look at things like Stonehenge and these other observatories, a lot of it was about determining lunations and eclipses. Where and when the eclipse is going to be? Well, and these storms and flooding and things like that often have a lot to do with the position of Neptune and Uranus. Mm. You know, Uranus is unexpected things or, uh, you know, uh, sort of outrageous kinds of things, things that have sort of never happened before. Yeah. You know, Neptune is the ruler of the sea and, you know, water is also uh, involved with Neptune. So, you know, with these two big planets being kind of uh, in connection with their both being retrograde and everything, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, potential for these unexpected, mm. even watery events to yeah. happen. And in, the, in fact, in the uh, last month in September, during the full moon, the uh, moon in Pisces was conjunct within, I think, one or two degrees to Neptune. And then we had Irma hit. I mean, right after that, it was a very powerful influence. And of course, this month, it's Jupiter. Jupiter changes sign. This happens once a year, typically. Sometimes Jupiter will back and forth a little bit over a line and through a retrograde, but it, when Jupiter changes sign, it's a big paradigm, and Jupiter's cycle is 12 years. And keep this in mind, Jupiter is bigger than the mass of all the other planets in the solar system put together. So he is the big guy in the plaid suit. <laughs> he is the big guy. You know, looking at the calendar, it's interesting to see that there's only one white circle day and one black box day. Usually there's a couple of each. Uh, and we'll talk about them a little bit as Ralph talks about the footnotes. So a lot of people have mentioned about how much they like those footnotes. You know, mm. so if you see the letter A in the top forecast, you'll find that letter A, gay, a again one in one of the boxes, and it will be the explanation you can refer back and forth and you can see the explanation of why that paragraph was in the forecast and what day it happens on so 
Ralph, you want to talk about yeah. the uh, footnotes? Well, for instance, the first one, A, is on the full moon. You know, this is, this is the Libra Aries full moon, moon in Aries. What's interesting about this one is that Venus is conjunct Mars, and Venus starts off the month in Libra. So Mars and, Lib Mars and Venus, or I'm sorry, that's Mercury. Mercury. Venus is in Virgo and enters Libra on the 14th, so it's Venus and Mars both in Virgo. This is why we say do things that are fun with your coworkers, because Mars and Venus and Virgo are, are planets that really like working with people they care about. So do something fun with your coworkers. And it also has a lot to do with you know, unifying these two sides of our personality, our desire to, to love and to give and our desire to be loved. You know, Mars is the desire to be expressive and Venus is the desire to be receptive. Exactly. And Virgo being the sign that relates mostly to work, your mm. workplace and your coworkers is interesting, but then they both move into Libra as well, and that right. makes the more personalized sort of one-on-one -on -one relationship time uh, as these Mars and Venus so frequently do this dance following each other in and out of signs. Right, and this is interesting too because, now remember the sun during this period of time is in Libra, but it's these smaller planets that are going from Virgo into Libra, and when Venus moves into Libra on the 14th, she's moving into her ruling sign. Venus rules Libra and Taurus, so she's moving into her ruling sign. Unfortunately, when Mars moves into um, Libra on the 22nd, he moves into one of his weakest signs because Mars rules Aries and Scorpio, so when it's in the sign opposite that, he's, what, he's in what's called a, a detriment, detriment position, and so it means he's not able to perform the way he is. But on the other hand... Don't worry, he's with his best friend Venus, and that, she is right. really rolling, so exactly. a lot of times that kind of rubs off. Exactly, and what's the, what's the, what's the male version of arm candy? <laughs> <laughs> You know, where you have a good-looking gentleman go with you, but it's really the girl who's in charge. Oh. And that's kind of the situation when Mars and, and Venus are both going to be in Libra. You know, when they're in Virgo, Virgo, Venus in Virgo is considered a relatively um, weak position. It's a, a, a detriment position. Um, Mars and Virgo is not considered a strong position. So when they're in that, those two, that, that conjunction on the fifth, there's a pretty good amount of parity, you might say. Okay. Now... Um, Jupiter enters Scorpio on the 10th and realize the Chinese system, the Chinese astrological system is based upon the position of Jupiter. What's Jupiter doing? In fact, people love it when we give the correspondence right. between the animal years and the Western astrological sign. So it starts out with um, Aries. And the analogous one from Aries is to the, the Chinese sign is the dragon. Dragon. Right. That's right. Yes, the dragon. And then they follow each other through the signs exactly. yes. the same way. So um, off the top of my head, you know, the Virgo is the rooster and Libra is right. the dog and uh, the horse is uh, Gemini and monkey is Leo. So you can find that there are similarities to the Western astrological sign. But again, it's like Ralph said, it's based on where the sign of Jupiter is, right. uh, where Jupiter is in a sign, but right. in the sidereal zodiac, not exactly. in the tropical zodiac. So, for instance, when, when Jupiter is in, um, is in Aries, it's in tropical Pisces. So, for instance, the rabbits are in, have Jupiter in Aries, even though it's tropical Pisces, well, tropical Pisces is considered, Jupiter and Pisces is a very spiritual position. Jupiter and Aries is a very aggressive position, so people born in the year of the rabbit tend to be a kind of aggressively spiritual, <laughs> because both energies are at work. Both, have, both, both zodiacs function in our lives, and that's part of the polarity of our personalities. So let's get back to the forecast. We should post that list of the yes. correspondences between the Chinese and the Western signs on our we'll, website. We'll post, so. we'll post that with the forecast. Exactly. exactly. You can, remember, you can go to spaceandtime.com, and you can find all of our forecasts there, other episodes, episodes of this show and our, the other shows that we produce. So. So what else do we have going on? Oh, but Jupiter going into Scorpio. You got us really, Jupiter has a lot to do with how do we plan for the future. And Jupiter has been in Libra for the past year. So the way we've planned for the future is by working in cooperation. And when we haven't kind of attained parity, 
arguing about it, usually in court. <laughs> and not really making a complete decision no. or a full commitment to anything because Libra Maybe. is not necessarily the most decisive sign. Exactly. But luckily, it's followed by Scorpio, and Scorpio's middle name is decisive. Exactly. So all of that sort of banter and what if and up and down and maybe this and maybe that is going to be followed with, you know, I am done with all this. Yes. I'm going to figure it out one way or the other. I'm going to commit to a course of action and then we'll be good. Yes. Like, for instance, to give me an idea, uh, if you if you want to go out to dinner with friends, never ask the Libran where they want to go. Because the Libran will want to know where you go first. It doesn't mean they don't know where they want to go, but they want to make sure that their, their idea is in accord with your idea. And they'll go back and forth. And the thing is, you can miss your dinner date because you're waiting for the, the Libran. What you have to do with Librans is to say, we're going here. Do you want to come with us? And we're leaving in five minutes. And then they have a structure. Or at most, give them two choices. We're either going for Chinese or we're going for tacos. And right. maybe they can make that decision. Maybe. Maybe. Exactly. <laughs> I have three planets in Libra. So it's really like, what do you want to do? No, what do you want to do? Exactly. No, what do you want to do? But Scorpio, Scorpio is the one that says, you know, we're going out to dinner there. We're going to leave in five minutes. How many seats do I get? <laughs> you know, how, what, what, what kind of reservation should I make? <laughs> because they're going to take charge and they're going to move things along. And it's not that they're not, they don't care about you or care about your opinion but they're very focused on accomplishment. So as Jupiter moves into Scorpio, really, with a, a lot of the legal stuff you've seen going on in the past year, you know, in uh, Washington and such, with Jupiter going to Scorpio, I think the gloves are gonna come off. Yeah. You know, people are gonna yeah. be playing for keeps. And that's one of the things about Jupiter and, and Scorpio, it plays for keeps. It's true. <laughs> I think that you can apply that, what do you wanna do? I don't know what you wanna do, that kind of dynamic sort of globally to a lot of uh, uh, different situations. And I think, as you say, when Jupiter, the big guy, gets to move into Scorpio, decisions have to be made. And uh, he's just big enough to make them. Exactly. Exactly. Um, da, 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 da. Well, so let's talk about the white circle and the black box. Oh, good idea. Because the 18th of October has a big old white circle on it. Yes. Well, that's really because um, you have a bunch of nice aspects and no bad aspects. You have Mercury conjunct Jupiter. Now, this is fun because Jupiter is, of course, the largest planet. Mercury is the smallest. But Mercury is very, very close to the sun, so it reflects the energy of the sun. It's very, very bright, so it has a lot of leverage. So even though it's not big and brassy, it's extremely bright. So that's why Mercury has always been related to communications and the, the quickness of the mind. And this might be a good time to mention that the parallels that we show on here, they're kind of similar in their function to a milder version of a conjunction. Uh, and so sometimes we don't put a lot of weight on the parallels uh, when we're determining whether there's a black box day or a white circle day, uh, denoting a good day to begin things with the white circle or a day to sort of put off starting something new or, or getting involved in a new big project mm -hmm. with the black box day. But these parallels are really to important big guys, you mm. know? And since Jupiter and uh, Mercury are conjunct already by a true conjunction, that par the parallels that they have both to the Sun and to uh, Saturn uh, really just make that that much stronger. So these are really pretty strong, supportive players on the day that will help support any undertaking you want to take into the day. We see that Pluto's below the line. That means it's making a not so great aspect with the moon. Aspects to the moon are kind of short lived yeah. and um, Pluto is the modern ruler of Scorpio, yeah. but really Mars is the ruler of Scorpio. So we didn't think right. that that was right. an inhibiting factor. Yeah, you have to watch out sometimes with moon transits. I mean, th th things do shift in the course of the day and can affect you very emotionally, but you have to watch out for micromanaging. You know, don't don't try to you know time things exactly to the minute you know uh, in the course of your day because you know you got to live your life. But this is interesting. You know, you've got the sun, you got the white circle that day, but the next day is the new moon. It's the sun conjunct the moon, and it's the sun opposite Uranus. These are always exciting days, challenging sometimes, but exciting, don't you think? Well, yeah, they're exciting. And also, you've got to avoid, of course, for most of the, the heart of the right. day. So, so you have to be a little bit careful on th days like that. But uh, you've got a, a footnote F there. 
Oh, yes, I do. Oh, my gosh, I yes. do. Yes, the new moon on the 19th. New paradigm for cooperative, determined, efficient action is in place. So, try you to said, keep up. exciting. Try to See? keep up. And try if, to keep up. And remember, you got the Mercury conjunct Jupiter. This is really good for kind of mentally getting in touch with and putting into practical terms your long-term goals. You know, Jupiter is all about your long-term goals. And wherever Jupiter is landing in your chart, in this case in Scorpio, you kind of look at your chart and say, well, where's, where's Jupiter traveling in my chart? You know, if it's traveling high in your chart, you know, by your midheaven, it's telling you career stuff is really going to take place. If it's traveling low in the chart, maybe through the fourth house, well, this is a good time maybe to add on to your home or to spend some money on your home. You know, if it's going through the seventh house, well, maybe you need to spend more time expanding your partnerships with people. So Jupiter is a big player. And remember, it's changed sign. But with the Mercury conjunct Jupiter, it's a way to kind of mentally get in touch with what are these long-term goals. And then the next mo day is this new moon with the sun opposite Uranus. And Uranus is all about kind of your kundalini, kundalini energy. And when the sun is opposite that, there's a real tendency for your energy to kind of like get sparked. You know, it can really get sparked up. So really use this to kind of tap into your genius, you know, your, your independent genius and get an idea of what it is you want to accomplish. Well, and speaking of energy getting sparked, your energy might get sparked on that black box day for the 27th, but it, not necessarily in a good way. Mm. There's, there's some challenges. There's some budding head of heads. Mm. You know, that's how I view this square is, you know, one's traveling in this direction, one's traveling in this direction. It kind of is that head-on collision at an intersection. Yeah. So we've got sun square moon, which happens all the time, and that's not the biggest aspect in terms of determining a black box day. But then you've got the Venus square Pluto, which is, is very mm. challenging. On a day when you've got uh, the moon in unpredictable and not very emotionally tied in uh, Aquarius, and then... Uh, you know, you've got Jupiter below the number, meaning it's not really making a good aspect to the moon during the day. So that optimism and that luck is not really getting emotional support. Uh, and so you just there's a lot going on there. So it's a little chaotic and mm. um, guaranteed if you're going to start off a new project on a day like that, mm. there's going to be unforeseen things that come out of the blue and just throw you off your pace or you know, throw the whole project into a delay or off kilter or you hit send and you realize you forgot all the attachments and, ah. you know, something quirky is going to happen. So if you can put that off until the following Monday or make sure you do it the day, day or two before, you're going to be in better shape with your projects. Yeah, exactly. And actually, one of the things that's kind of nice about this month is that the, the bumps in the road are spaced out. And bumps in the road happen when a planet changes sign. There's a weird little phenomenon that happens when a planet changes sign. You will, you will feel it. It's like all of a sudden things just get a little discombobulated for a day. We call it turbulence. Yeah, exactly. So you have them on various different We don't days. like turbulence on the plane? No. We don't like turbulence in our life. No. So one is on the 10th. It's around the 10th, and that's Jupiter. The next one is actually the 14th, and that's when Venus goes into Libra. But that's a very nice aspect. So once Venus gets into Libra, you will find that... You know, the ability to communicate love and to communicate with other people and find common ground with them becomes much easier. Then a couple of days later on the 16th, Mercury enters Scorpio. Uh, not a super, not a, what's kind of a, called a dignified position, but a very effective position. Well, I have to say, when Mercury is in Scorpio, try to invoke the count to 10 rule. Yes. Because things will come out of your mouth and you will literally say, did I say that out loud? So Scorpio really gets to the point, throws in the zingers, then turns and walks away, leaves you in the dust. Yes. So if you don't want to lose a few friends or <laughs> something, right. watch out when Mercury is in Scorpio. Right. And then on the 21st and 22nd, be kind of, be a little bit on your toes. And the reason is it's that it's the or Orionid meteor showers. Did I say it right? Orion. Basically, they're taking place in the area of Orion. And those go on the 21st and the 22nd. And on the 22nd, the sun enters Scorpio. Okay. And Mars enters Libra at the same time as those meteor showers. So it's going to be a whole bunch of bumps in the road, but in a very kind of exciting way. And remember, Orion was, is, was kind of the hero of the zodiac, the giant you know, and it, it, when you have a lot of activity in that area, it really has a lot to do with 
kind of recognizing the hero within ourselves, you know, the, the, the strong man, the strong, strong woman. Well, and it happens at the time that the moon is changing from Scorpio to Sagittarius. Mm. And Sagittarius really sort of gets you outside of yourself. Right. You know, you've kind of been emotionally in a cave with the moon in Scorpio. But, in, you know, when the moon goes into Sagittarius, you start to feel a little bit more optimistic, want to get out there a little bit yep. more, sort of expand your horizons you know, meet the world and meet other people. So, you know, all this activity is kind of building up into that sort of push you out into the world. Yeah, exactly. But then from there, from the 22nd on through the end of the month, there's no other ingresses. Nothing else is changing signs. So it's kind of smooth. So like I said, the bumps, you know, they're, the speed bumps are kind of spread out. It's kind of like when you're on that road, you know, you're going through some that development of the speed bumps, but at least they're nice and far away. You can kind of plan. It's not like this one after the other after another. It's not like we were bombarded in August exactly. and September, you know. I mean, this has like a little pace. Like, you know, you've got like a thing a week. Yeah. <laughs> you exactly. know, like once yeah. a week there's a little boop, you know. And Sometimes you, go, okay. you get one, you get an ingress, and two days later you get another one, and two days later you get another one. It's like, oh, God, it's like bouncing all the time. You can yeah. barely get on track before you have to change gears again. You know, so it's... Uh, and this would be the month for the little boo here and there because it's the month of Halloween. Right? Yes, exactly. Halloween on the 31st. The daylight savings time ends on the 29th in the EU, at least. Um, what else is interesting I think interesting it's the first week on? in November when the uh, First week in November here. Daylight starts. But in case you're doing a lot of businesses in the EU, in the European Union, it's good yep, to know. It doesn't say. Hmm. So, and... Um, like I said, the, the most important thing to be kind of aware of this month, I think it has a lot to do with Jupiter. I think we should, we should talk a little bit about how Jupiter um, plays a role in a person's life. There's a, there's a, you know, 100, 150 years ago and before, way before then, whenever people would talk philosophically, people like Ralph Waldo Emerson and Ralph, Ralph Waldo Trine and um, Emerson, um, when they would talk about things they would use astrological symbolism you know they would say you know a mercurial wit because Merc they, mercury was the god of communication therefore when a person was witty it was mercurial or you know a great a lady was very venusian or very aphrodite like and such or someone had a yeah. saturnine <laughs> demeanor yeah and one of the ways they would describe our our better natures a person's better nature their more kind of expansive their more generous nature was to call them jovian it's very common. Or jovial, term. that's where jovial. the word jovial exactly. comes from. Exactly. And it's from the term Jove, which means it's Jupiter or it's Zeus. It's the other name for Jupiter. Jupiter and Zeus. Right. And it was about the fact that, you know, that sun in our charts represents our stable, consistent, kind of very, very slowly changing, if changing at all, spiritual personality, you know, kind of our core spiritual program. In fact, so much so that when you look at people's charts to determine um, what their professions should be, many times the sun is not a factor, or it's not the big factor. You think the sun would be the main factor in these things, but in truth, there's other players that are more important to this. The midheaven, the point right above your head, the sign right up there, or any planets up there have a lot more to do with it. I mean, the sun is a factor, but it's not the, as big a factor as you think, but in terms of our ability to expand our horizons, to our ability to plan our long-term education, our ability to decide where we're going to be, our ability to be generous. To be optimistic, to be willing to travel and expand our, our knowledge, to, um, you know, to learn about other <laughs> cultures or to seek higher education. They're all functions of the Jupiter and the way that works in our chart. Exactly. So, for instance, people who have Jupiter in the first house, you know, at the, at the Eastern Rising, tend to be bigger than life personalities. Now, it has to do with what sign it's in. Now, if it was Jupiter in Sagittarius, one of the ruling signs, they'll probably be very athletic. Now, in truth, famous athletes tend to have Jupiter overhead a little bit to the west of directly overhead. It's what in astrology we call the Gogolon spot. It means it's a little bit to the western side of the midheaven. And it just has to be, it happens to be a spot that gets very, very activated. And for professional athletes, they also tend to have Mars just above the rising in the Gogolon spot there. It's, it's a famous position for a professional athlete. Why? Because the Mars gives them that physical determination. 
but the Jupiter gives them that ability to see great distances, you know, to, to plan strategically, you know, among a large group of people to have the optimism that I can win. I was just going to say, how much of sports is that optimism? You know, you don't go out playing or competing in any kind of sport thinking that you're most assuredly going to lose. You know, you have to be optimistic about your goals and and achieving them in order to participate in sports of any kind. And it's interesting, too. A lot of times when people have Jupiter in the same position, high, you know, up in that Gogolin spot, they're oftentimes philosophers. In fact, a lot of astrologers have their Jupiters there. It's about having a longer view of life. Okay, now if Jupiter is in maybe your fourth house, put down below your chart in the area that relates to home, one of your ambitions will be to have a big family, you know, to expand in terms of your home life. This is what's going to matter to you. This is the area where you're, you know, out in the world you may not be thought of as a jovial person, but in your home life, it's the person you're going to be the person that everyone wants to come and visit and be fed by. Or, yeah, maybe the one with the biggest house. <laughs> right. Or exactly. the biggest property. Exactly. And then if a Jupiter's in the seventh house, you know, sitting in the west, it well, has a, usually has a lot to do with you. Will be, you will look for a partner who is like this, a partner that's bigger than life, a partner maybe from a foreign land. And it's also generosity <laughs> toward a partner or right. generosity toward your family if it's in the fourth or generosity. You know, people just see you as a generous person if it's in the first house. Right. You know? And it's interesting. Many times artists will have... Jupiter in the 12th house. Well, the 12th house is the area of retreat, which is kind of funny, but it's also the area of the studio. And it means when they get into the seclusion of the studio is when their greatest energies come out. So it's very helpful to know in your, in your own chart, where is Jupiter? Where, are, where do your better angels live? You know, where is your Jovian self most at home? In which house? You know, so that you can, you can allow it to express itself. You know, many times people will put themselves into patterns that work for other people, but not necessarily well for them. And it's one of the great things about astrology is it helps us recognize who we are. That's why people go to astrologers, right? They come in and we basically talk about them for an hour. It's like, great, they love it. And they wonder how we could possibly know this, but guess what? It's right there in the chart. So, so, Let's hope that you all have Jupiter returns this year because yes. every 12 years your Jupiter comes back to the same position it was when you were born yep. and you somehow get to reset and re-energize that optimism you were born with. That's so, why people love when they turn 12, they love when they turn 24, they love when they turn 36, all these multiples of 12 because it's during the time of your Jupiter return. Not so much with Saturn, but we'll talk about him Saturn, another time. Saturn, we'll talk about him another one. Let Saturn make an ingress and we'll <laughs> change signs. We'll talk, we'll give him equal time. Okay. So, so I think we'll wrap up. I think that's it for October 2017. Join us again at uh, Planetary Calendar uh, TV. And uh, you can always watch other episodes of our show at www.spaceandtime.com. Thank you and be well. <laughs>